we're gonna we're gonna talk uh, today about your very fascinating journey. I have to say that I've been obviously reading, learning, researching more about Gore, and there is so much, so many things I wanted to ask you, but we'll only have to settle. We're talking about your journey as an entrepreneur, which is a lot, uh, a lot to share, I'm sure. Uh, how uh, you disrupted and leaded your domain and leading your domain as Cato Networks, your go-to market strategy, growth phases, and of course, after that, you will be able to ask Guru some questions. But before I'm moving on to you, I just want to give just some... Just in answer to the yeah. question that you asked me afterwards, we're hiring, so... <laughs> That's all you need to know. Thank you. Boom, we the drums. So just before we start, to make sure everybody knows uh, who's sitting next to me, then Gulshat uh, is the co-founder and COO of Cato Networks, which is uh, the first company to converge enterprise networking and security into one centralized and global service that is delivered by the cloud. And they even received their own product category named SAS or S-A-S-E. Sassy. Sassy by Gardner. So that's very sassy and amazing of you. Uh, prior to Cato Networks, uh, he was the co-founder and CEO of Incapsula. Uh, cloud-based web application security and ex uh, acceleration company. Before that, uh, he was, get this, he was the director of product development, the vice president of engineering, and vice president of products at Imperva. And the reason he had at least three titles is because you were their first employee, so you had to, you had to improve with it, right? <laughs> and then you sold Incapsula to Imperva, um, and uh, yeah, you did a lot of a lot of exciting things in this uh, region. And without further ado, before we dive into the actual cyber and business and so on, we want to know who is Gore. So if you want to share a bit, who are you? What were your dreams growing up? Um, what are your passions? What led you to what you do today? Yeah, have well, a few minutes. Yeah, it's, uh, I'll be short about it. I don't I don't think it's the interesting part. You know what I did growing up. Uh, hopefully. Uh, and, and generally, uh, I didn't think I would do startups. I really, really resented the idea of making, you know, taking the danger out of things. And the only reason I just, I wasn't in a 2800 20, unit as well. Uh, in fact, I was their arch nemesis coming from the Air Force, and, and they didn't like me at all. Um, so. So I didn't have like the DNA to, to be a startup person. The only reason eventually that I joined one and then joined another and then you know started my own was that I was really bad at working with a lot of people and I was too stubborn basically to accept any other, other people's you know directives. So you know where do you go if you need to be in charge? So that that's the story. But what were your dream growing up? Did you have an idea of what would you like to do as a grown up? Yeah, I wanted to be an astronaut. <laughs> and, and, Two. Oh, well, lots of lots of things. Uh, but but you know, software was never one of them. Yeah. So it was just yeah, it happened. It, it happened. Just happened. Yeah. Just happened. Which is life. Yeah. As life has it. Now again, you work with three companies. You build them. You you sold them. Some of them you um, uh, developed them. So after those twenty years. What are your tips to building a company that is attractive for investors and clients? Um, I know they're, they're, they're the usual answers, like great product, great team, but what are like real deep tips of building a company that is attractive to the market? Yeah, so um, I guess that that's the first thing everyone asks, right? What, what is it that investors are looking for and, and you know what are they looking for in your companies? Who are here thinking about starting their company at some point? Cool. Okay. So uh, let's start with the, the, the cold reality. Investors don't really care about the ideas. They don't. They don't necessarily go that way as the first thing they look at. Basically, investors look at teams. They 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 you know they're, they're machine learning kind of people. They're like. Their experience tells them that they invest in where people have already succeeded in the team, so so they just pour their money there. But so that, that's 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 the hard news for people raising money for the first time. But if you want to have a successful company that investors would look you know favorably on, you need to basically answer three questions, and hopefully those 
three questions that you're going to answer are going to be the exact exact three questions that the, you know the investors will look at. And the first thing is, what is so crappy in the world that it will be worth money to solve? What is the the thing that is so crappy that really requires a solution? And I think that most companies, if you look at them, come out of the fact that there is some bit of crap in the world that nobody thinks can be cleaned up. And by that is, is, is like the first thing. Do you, have you identified something that is worth money uh, to solve? The second thing is, if it's something that's already broken in the world, why wasn't it fixed before that? I mean, why, why are you the first people coming into this trying to solve this problem? It doesn't make sense, right? Has something changed in the world that allows now for something to be solved? Is there an opportunity somewhere? And, and why is that? Because it, that, it makes no sense if it's a problem that has existed for a long time, it doesn't make sense that you were the first one to try to solve it. And there are not like 20, 40, or 100 companies trying to do the same thing. And the last thing is, assuming you, know, you have both identified a problem and identified you know, the opportunity why it can be solved right now, are you the right people to solve it? I mean, you know, why, why you of all people? And that's something that investors are actually looking for. What they're looking for in a way, with your know, first time you know, uh, teams, is do you have some sort of uh, secret knowledge about the problem? Do you know some sort of inside track about why it happens and how to solve it? Is there something special about you that nobody else knows that you can actually say, you know, we, we have, we, we can do this thing and nobody else before us did. And that's the, really the, the, the essence. So if you have a, a, a clear yes for the three questions, then, then you have a good company in the way. Can you, can you repeat the three questions again? So what, what is, why is so crappy in the world it's going to be worth money to invest in and, and to get money out of? What is, uh, the opportunity, why why something can be solved now and has not been solved for like five years ago or 10 years ago, why why now and what has changed so it's now possible. And the third thing is, why you? What are you so, why are you so special in, in your ability to solve something like that? So that's that's the three questions, hopefully, um, you know, you're up to set the next Facebook. I love it. It's not like Facebook. Well, Facebook Meta, maybe Meta. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but I like how you you structured it and you also answered question to a question. But uh, but but there is no one size fits all, of course. There is yeah. no one formula. So I think this is very very helpful. Now, if I'm going back to actually to your history, so you and uh, Shlomo Kremel, yeah. uh, which was your investor in, in Perva and. Um, and then obviously you, you created this company together. Then they decided they're going they're going to um, create Cato Networks, and they were in I don't know if it was a garage or an office for two months, trying to find the the solution that Cato will uh, provide to the world. And after two months of hard work, you decided it's a crappy idea. Yeah. So how? My question to you is actually two questions: How to know? if an idea is crappy, and it's better two months than two years, of course, mm -hmm. and if you had any formula to define a good product, a good solution. Um, so I, I can tell basically uh, the story of why, why we changed our mind, uh, maybe um, it would sort of answer the question. It, it's, it's a bit embarrassing, we haven't you know, discussed you know, a lot of our founding story, I think, it, because it's a bit embarrassing. So the, the thing is, the, but it's, yeah, most, most companies have either, I guess, a, a, an embarrassing story or a made up one. So <laughs> at least I wonder. Let's go to the authentic one. <laughs> yeah, so um, the thing is that it's, it's all about uh, self-delusion. Um, and when we set up to start the company, Basically, um, we had a lot of ideas that we went through, coming from the knowledge that we gained, etc. And one idea was was about like the cloud firewall that was basically Cato. But I, yeah, you know, we dismissed it almost immediately. I dismissed it because you know it's undoable. 
we shouldn't get there because it's undoable. I dismissed it. And the, the real reason was that, you know, for the previous five years, I've been running around trying to protect a managed network from botnet attacks and in, in a denial of service uh, protection company. So who here knows what a botnet is? Botnet? It's, it's, it's what all your computers are doing when you're not protecting them. So they, you know, someone takes over your computer and now it becomes a member of the botnet and gets, goes to attack another site. Now, uh, my previous company, uh, company Encapsula, uh, protected uh, sites from botnet performing DDoS attacks on them. Who, who has heard about the term DDoS, denial, through the denial service? Okay, cool. So, uh, so five years, and I, I don't know if you realized it, but botnets do not operate during uh, normal business hours. <laughs> so you're just as likely to handle a crisis on Friday night as you are to handle it on, on Tuesday morning. So definitely I did not want to have ever anything to do with another you know, a critical infrastructure company for the next you know, 10 years or so. Uh, so basically, you know, so we went on and, and, and had another idea. And that idea was, had some similarities to what Cato was, but in that case, all the, uh, it, was, it was not a global network, a managed network. It had appliances, and they were safely tucked away you know, in the customer premises. So we didn't have to worry about maintaining an infrastructure. And the thing is, was that we were so desperate to have a good idea to work on. Um, because basically, we, we were like actors who thought that they will not get an acting job if they weren't all, also the director and the producer. So we knew we had to start something. Um, and so we were so obsessed about you know, having the right, and, and we just deluded ourselves. We talked about it, you know, working on this idea for like two months you know, with the computers and the appliances and, and all sorts of things. And, um, and then two months on, um, so at some point, I think um, it was like um, an, an afternoon, we were talking on the phone, and Shlom was telling me sort of, uh, do you realize that in order for someone to buy this, to be an enterprise uh, person, buying uh, and replacing this and replacing that and changing this and changing that, and we were looking at each other and, you know, or, or actually staring at each other because it was on the phone. <laughs> there was like a silence. And then we said, no, it's not going to work. It's, it's, it's not going to happen. Because for a moment there, we had a crack, a big crack in our self-delusion. And, you know, like, like in the song when there's, when there's the crack, so the light gets in. <laughs> So, so um, yeah, we, we said, you know, it's not going to happen, it's not good. And then Shlomo says, you know, but what about the, the cloud firewall thing? Maybe that's doable. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, two, give me two hours, I'll think about it. And after two hours, I came back and said, yeah, it's doable. Um, you know, and, and, and by that time, we had the whole company, you know, minus one pivot, Everything was laid out, technology, architecture, everyone, everything was set at that time. And, and Shomo was excited. I mean, he was like, yeah, this is going to be like Encapsula and Checkpoint together, and we're going to have like an infrastructure company and doing you know, And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and he didn't, you know, I didn't think he realized, you know, what we were signing in for <laughs> at that point. And then like, fast forward to like three years later, and, and the company is up and running, and we have, you know, production customers, and we have a global outage. <laughs> and so, I, I, and global outage is like all the network is down, and so I'm in the ops room with our head of operations trying to figure out what the hell is going on. And we're like, and. Um, so, and, and the network is down, okay? That's, that's the worst case scenario. That's years of your life. 
basically. So if you, if you ever run infrastructure companies, that, that's, that's the worst that can happen. So, and, and we're trying to figure out what's going on, and then Shlomo rushes into the room. <laughs> and, and, uh, and he mouth <laughs> to me, and, and I was sort of like doing that, <laughs> just to keep him updated. Um, so, and as I, you know, as I, I basically um, go like this, his phone begins to ring, and he, and, and he, and he, he picks it out of his pocket, and then I see him like looking at his his, 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 his phone, like it was a live rat, <laughs> and it's ringing, and I know exactly who it is because there's one customer that has his personal phone number and he was calling that minute because we had a global outage. And he looked so deflated at that moment and that was the moment that he realized what we signed up for. So, uh, so that, 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 that was it. So the, the real thing you know, about it is, is the moment where you're, there's a crack in your self-delusion and, and um, I can, can I ramble a bit more on, on, on this? So, a few years later, I read a, a, a different account that was so um, so familiar uh, that that it just took my breath away because it was the same exact same thing. And it's a story. It's not even a startup story. It's a story about Intel. So Andrew Grove, uh, the CEO, the legendary CEO of Intel, was telling the story. Of uh, of a time, and I think it's it, if you read the book, have you ever anyone read uh, Only Paranoid Survive? Mm. Uh, you should should great book, lousy title. Uh, but anyway, he was telling the story of how Intel was was just being clobbered at one point by makers of you know Japanese makers of memory chips, and they couldn't win because they were beating them on pricing, they were beating them on on quality, they were being, they just didn't know how to win. And then, so so Andrew Grove writes that, so he was sitting with Gordon Ward, the CEO. Then, they were there actually standing, looking outside at, at the Ferris wheel, you know, outside the corporate office in the amusement park nearby. And they were like very very miserable. And and suddenly, so 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 Andrew Grove turns to Gordon Ward and says, you know, when the board finally fires us, you know, what do you suppose the new CEO is going to do? And, 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 and Gordon will say like, immediately, they'll get us out of the memory. At that moment. And Andrew Grove is shocked. You know, like, what? And then he says, okay, but, so let's assume, let's assume that we just, why don't we just step outside the room here and go back in and do exactly that? And that's exactly what they did. And that saved the company. Because what was inconceivable a moment before that, once they, they got a, a crack in their self-delusion, it became obvious a moment later. So in order to pivot, you really need to have this crack and really face up to uh, you know beyond all your biases, etc. But I'm also taking from your story that once this crack is coming, it's also about the quality of your questions. They ask, what if someone that would, you know, would fire us, or the board would fire us? So also about the quality of the questions that would help you find possibly the... Yeah, you have to be honest about the questions and, 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 and yeah. try to get some tough questions out yeah. there. Which sometimes when you're pushed, then it's time where you can really find those answers. Um, now you have fast forward. Uh, you have raised over five hundred thirty-two million uh, dollars, of course, and um, plus or minus, yeah, <laughs> plus minus. Um, now, obviously, it was it's not your first uh, rodeo, and you were both people who were appreciated in the industry, and and I'm sure, obviously, you're appreciated. You you proved it. You're talented. Then again, what would be your um, uh, your tips for startup founders? This may be their first startup. And also considering the the economic climate, if there's any any tip that you think they should, you could give them on raising some millions, yeah. C, A. Um, um, I'd say that you know, I, I was once asked you know whether um, 
you know, where we knew what we were doing, and, and, and our people said that, you know, two months, after two months, we had everything laid out, and we knew exactly what's going on, and what the company would be, and what was the architecture, and what the technology you, was. Like, after, the, after, like, the, you know, the two months that we wasted, the, what, once we settled on the, what the cloud firewall would be, it was very, very It was simple. clear. It was very, very clear. Where you were. Like, yeah. Did you know it's going to be a unicorn? Um... I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm not going to answer. But you know, you knew where you're going. Okay. Yeah, we knew, but we knew it was going to be big. Yeah. We knew it was going to be big, and it was going to be a big effort. And we knew uh, that if it worked, it would be, you know, a, a complete thing. Uh, we had one pivot left to make, but but generally it was Cato. Now the um, the thing is, when you think about it, uh, so. Presumably, we had like a, a year or so working on it, and and you'd say and you'd think that we didn't basically, you know, have to ask anybody or so, and and that was a, I was saying, you know, that you know we did not do what companies should do, and that was try to validate, go out and and ask, you know, what's going on, but then I thought about it, and and it's not really correct, because. The most important thing for a startup is to go out and figure out whether you know the idea is good as it meets reality. And that's the most important thing for startups. Don't think that you have the answers in your room. And and I think when I think about it, we didn't just look into the room and, and figure out what the idea for the company is. What we did was we then went ahead and validated it. Because even before there was a product. And before we had a product out, we had like sales teams. We had salespeople trying to sell our non-existent product and getting real product feedback for that non-existent product yet. And it gave us some valuable insight as to who are the users that, that will buy it and who are the ones that maybe we shouldn't bother for. So just getting that feedback was enormous. We also like paid a company to get us interview with all sorts of IT people. You know, and to figure out whether they like the idea or if it's bad, and we also ask people. So there's a lot of validation that you need to do in order to know that you're on track, and that's that's a very important part of it because there's no way that you know inside the the office or wherever the garage or wherever you are, you get answers towards the question of whether it's a really good idea or whether it's crap. So. I think that's a very, uh, very important and good lesson, as you said. Eventually, this is how you learn. Now, it took Cato one and a half years to like tweaking your service offering. That's what you did in, the, in this one and a half years, or I, I think actually, so one and a half years sounds like a lot, but for infrastructure, that's that's like a blink of an eye because just negotiating with data centers around the world and buying hardware and shipping it. That, that took months in itself. So, uh, and as I said, you know, so if, if, if you want to launch and have like real production customers with, within a year and a half, that basically means that within a year you have to be up and running. Yeah. Because for the first half of the, of the, the second year, we we're basically crashing the network every other week. Uh, so, so you have to have this like, you know, you're complete on the features and then you sort of make the way to graduate uh, until you, you release, but uh, it, was, it was really fast, you know, looking back. Yeah, as you said, in this, in this industry. Now, you, you have definitely succeeded in a competitive market. Uh, you became the market leader, uh, selling against Cisco, Palo Alto Networks, and many others. And a personal uh, interest for me, and I'm sure for you too, is what was your, your first um, sales um, strategy when you starting out, did, when you got your first uh, pilot uh, partners or first clients, and fast forward today, what is your sales strategy today that enabled you eventually to become a market leader? Um, strategy, I think. It, <laughs> the, I, I really can say that the, the strategy for if, if I think about our first major customer, the strategy was whatever. Whatever I, I'm not going to say because they were on service and and, and uh, but but they were like a major company and the way that we addressed their issues and we were going to say yes to whatever they asked for uh, just make the sell uh, and, and and make sure this, the network is up and running and um, 
basically, so the, the, the idea is was to be desperate enough to just make it work, regardless. So is there like a buzz? Okay. So if I if I go like this, does it sound like? Can you try maybe something? I'll, I'll make it a bit a bit further away. Does it does does it still it's something that you have to be with the speaker is the itself. Okay, we're checking it. Okay. So this is a so maybe it's here or something like that. No, it's no. Sorry, that's a record. But you have good view from here. I can do an advertise for you. <laughs> yeah. One, one thing I never wanted to do was a singer. For what? A singer? <laughs> never. Never. You can try one. We're not going to ask you to do it today. Fantastic. Sorry, so you, you, were, you were talking about the, uh, the sales strategy. Yeah, so, so yeah. first customer is just saying, just make, make, work is held to make it work and, and sell to anyone who will buy. But one thing that, you know, is, is probably our biggest asset at first, was um, this, the sales, the sales thing. So one thing that we had like uh, a, a, a brilliant uh, VP of marketing, uh, we still our chief strategist today. And but they, but what he basically said was, if the idea is great, and if you have um, the right presentation, and it's structured really, really well, then you can go very, very further ahead. And you get a lot of points going into the PFO, like from the sales pitch to the POC. So instead of just, you know, schlepping something together, they built a very, very structured sales deck that had like, you could just read it out loud for salespeople. And once you have like the sales, the corporate deck, and everyone knows about it, and they're able to really practice it, on using it, then you have something that you can really replicate and, and work at scale at. And, and salespeople just, you know, practice and, and deliver the sales pitch on the, the corporate sales deck, and, and you can know that it works, right? So they know how to do things, and they, they don't just improvise it. Uh, and that, that's important. I think the sales deck is really an often neglected part of, of, of the way you do things, especially in a time when it starts to change a lot and, and you make the transition. So you will say, why do I bother? Maybe it's a conversation. It's really, really important. And so you said the sales deck at the beginning, so it was actually a, a scripted or, or a prepared? Yeah, like very, you, very. You very cracked good. it, you knew what, how to do it? And once you yeah, do it, so, you just replicate so it. So credit to Ishai. Our, our uh, VP marketing and strategist today, uh, a lot of work went into really making it a, he said, we call it uh, a, a non-refutable presentation. <laughs> it's sort of like, at the end of the presentation, it says QED, and, and, and it's, it's, it's done, because it, it answers all the questions, it's very, very well structured, it's something that you can just memorize, and, 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 and help you to handle objections, etc. So it's really, really important. So that helped you uh, at the beginning, and fast forward today, I'm sure you have a better and a different script, but um, still you, you managed to become market leader. So I'm trying to understand what else can we learn from, from what you did and how you did things. Um, I, I think, you know, it's really a matter, you know, it's for, for different companies and different startups, it would be different. Uh, a, a company needs like something that like, uh, you know. A friend of mine once said, "What's our unfair advantage? What's our unfair advantage against the competition?" You know, every company needs to have this sort of idea that they have an unfair advantage somewhere that they can leverage the hell out of. For us, it was our architecture. We knew that nobody else is going to set up something similar, and we knew that we can leverage the hell out of it because we'll have better features and be more reactive and performance better. So we knew that that was our unfair advantage and that was to, what took us forward in a time where, frankly, nobody cared about it. 
because you know, in the first four years that the company existed, nobody cared, nobody knew why cloud firewalls or network as a service or firewall as a service did matter. Or yeah. There was a lot of, of, of haze in the air. Mm -hmm. and, and only like four years later, uh, Gartner came up and says, you know, we have this new invention called SASE, and they just copied everything we did. Uh, and, and once that was clear, then things sort of, architecture really became something that not just com customers are, were caring about, but also like competitors and the market as a whole. And it actually brings me back to where you started from. So when you said that you, both of you came from a very strong background in, in networks, in um, again, the cyber, in how to protect. Um, and you said that the founder should have strong, uh, you said, why you? Why yeah. you were the one, so why you? You saw uh, the future, you saw where this industry is going because or thanks to your experience, and it seems like you, you actually brought it even to the market. Before the market knew there was a, a problem, you brought it to the market, and then when Gartner said sassy, it's like, yeah, well, we knew it already. Yeah, we were yeah. Like, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what we were saying. Yeah. As we Just were saying. <laughs> that's amazing. Like yeah. looking back, you know, connecting the yeah, dots. Yeah, but it can, was, I think, you know, yeah. if you look at most companies, most companies are very good at solving their own problems. So, so if you have a problem, then you can really, when I said like that there's like this secret knowledge that you come with, sometimes the knowledge is the fact that the problem that the company is trying to solve is your own problem. Mm -hmm. And you have the idea of how to solve it. So for us, you know, our experience in managing networks, etc., made us aware of the fact that you know, it was really crappy. Yeah, and then as you said, it was an, uh, an unfair advantage, and obviously, again, it's amazing uh, that you have uh, become the market leader and, and again, changed this industry. Um, and this industry, again, it's the cyber industry, on the one hand, considered um, kind of a stable, I would say, now with everything that happens, we all need, everybody needs cyber and it's getting stronger and more and more and more important as technology evolves. Having said that, and I'm referring to one of your uh, former interviews, is that there are always um, the new, not new cables, but new players out there that they bring different types of solutions. And with that in mind, now that you're being, you're being a, a bigger company and maybe processes are, are not as agile or fast to change as it was before, how do you defend your uh, your position as a market leader these days? Um, um, so, I, I guess for 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 companies coming to the market today, um, I, I'd say that you know generally what protects us today is that I talked before about like unfair advantage. In the competitive sense, the same thing is also a moat. So the big question is, um, how fast do you need to run in order to outrun the competition? And how badly or how, how difficult is it going to be for someone else to try to build whatever you're building? And usually, if you don't, if you have a high enough mode, well, it's not, actually a mode is it's like dug enough, it's deep enough mode, right? It's, it's like a, a, where the crocodiles are. <laughs> and anyway, so... Um, I just visited crocodiles last week in uh, Key Largo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so, saw them. So, so the moat is, is the, the, the deeper it is, and the more crocodiles you have in it, um, is, is um, the, more, the more you have security in that there won't be other companies and startups trying to go after you. So if you if you if if you want to have no competitors or, or or not many competitors, really select like a really shitty you know niche that nobody wants to touch, and 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 you'll have security there. So I don't know if it's a good advice, but <laughs> you said create your unfair advantage in in yeah. in a such way that it will be harder to to crack and come. And, and if, we're, if we're getting more into um, the Israeli cyber uh, scene, and again, with all the, with the economic uh, crisis and, and all the uh, predictions and so on, um, what, how do you see the challenges that cybersecurity companies in Israel face? Uh, challenges, and maybe is there room to, to be optimistic uh, about what's coming? Uh, sure, there's room to be optimistic, because uh, I, what, what, what fills me with optimism is the fact that, you know, 
the evil doers are not going to go away anytime soon. So, yeah. so for us, <laughs> there's always going to be room and, and, and work to do. Uh, and that, that just fills me with uh, great optimism. Uh, as well. <laughs> It's, it's like you know, as long as as long as there are graves, there's be place there be place for grave diggers, uh, and um, so. But, but generally speaking, I think that there is a problem in the cyber security realms today. I would not, you know, recommend necessarily going into the cyber domain today unless you really really know what you're doing and what you're. And and, and the reason is. So, and, and the reason is, is it okay now? Or is it just my voice? No, no, it's okay. <laughs> oh, I was worried it was me. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, so the thing about cyber is that, I don't know how many cyber companies there are today in Israel alone, I think it's the hundreds. And, all, and most of them are solving like niche problems and niche areas. And, and the world is, is, is not going there. Uh, the world is going into a different place, and and and, uh, and I think that the, the, the real place that the world is going into is 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 really um, well, maybe I'll start with a story. Like like 25 years ago, many of you were not born then, but <laughs> but generally, like the, the, there was a company that tried to take over every experience users have online. The company was Microsoft. And they tried to take over the browsers. They tried to take over the, you know, the the, the, the the users' operating system. And the Department of Justice in the U.S., you know, basically cracked down on them. And said, "Okay, we're going to split you up like we did AT&T." And they they survived by the skin of their teeth, and kept themselves a single company, right? And they figured out that maybe it wasn't such a good idea to try to monopolize consumers. Maybe we should let like you know other browsers exist in our and, and maybe maybe not go after everything. And um, but on the other hand, they doubled down on monopolizing everything that was enterprise related. So we what we're seeing today is that there's like all the big companies and enterprises just get sucked in to those large companies like Amazon's and, 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 and Microsoft with Azure and all their cyber capabilities and, 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 and Palo Alto and their cyber capabilities. So there's not really room for a small niche solution to coexist with other solutions. Everything is going to get sucked into you know, one or three or four black holes of functionality. Uh, so in the cyber realm, that means Maybe if you're thinking short term, you might get acquired. Uh, but on the longer term, everything is going to get sucked into one center of gravity or another. Uh, we hope to become a center of gravity at Cato rather than being sucked into someone else's center of gravity. Uh, but, but generally, that's, that's the trend that things are going. It's not going to the niche, it's going to the center. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, I like how you put it, like the how you view it, your strategy, yeah. where you're going to be in the center. Everything. Yeah. <laughs> everything's still. Yeah, everything is strategized. Now, I don't want to embarrass you again, but um, me and I'm sure all of us here, um, like you really, you did something amazing and you really live the dream of a lot of, of, of entrepreneurs that would love to, to become um, you know, leaders of their industry and, and work in different and create different companies and so on. Um, and in a former interview, I think it was with Guy Katsovich, um, I think you mentioned that you sold Encapsula, and, and when you sold the company, it was, it was such a hard feeling for you. It was, I think the word, I'm not sure, even was kind of a failure, a very hard, tough feeling of selling a company. And yeah. if you can get us into your mind of, of how the experience of selling a company, how do you experience it? it, it why was it so hard for you? Um, uh, well, uh, I think it depends. Um, I, I can mine it maybe, but the, the thing is that that um, when I think every every entrepreneur thinks and wants to set up the last company, you know, the one that would you know go out to the horizon, and 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 they never do in a way. 
right? It's very rare for, for a company to go really all the way and, and keep growing and keep advancing and, you know, it's, it's something, something chain always gives up in the, in the end. Uh, and, and, well, I know it's really... Can you call it? You know what? We can, we can. I can, I, I think maybe, that maybe we can like do it without. Yeah. Is it okay? Is it better? Yeah. I just raise yeah. my voice. <laughs> microphone check. Okay. Let's try without, and if you feel like you're too much, uh, this, this thing. Yeah. If you feel like you're too much, okay. So, so now, right now? Wow, no. Now, right now. Amazing. So now, finally, we get like a good sound. <laughs> So, um, uh, you know, just a second, maybe, maybe like, it's like a position, if I'm like this. Maybe we'll headset, headset. Okay. One leg, one leg, one leg. Okay, so, um, so I'll, I'll talk loudly and, 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 you know, my natural world voice does not miss, so, so, so it's going to be okay. Um, where were we, we were talking about? about um, Company, selling a company, how was ah, the experience okay. for you? So, we, uh, so the, the core thing is that I always wanted to, to set up the last company, uh, the one to die in, the one that would continue on and flourish forever. It, it, it doesn't happen. And the thing is that if you think that there's, if it's a matter of, of whether it was the way it was supposed to be, then okay. But if you're sort of frustrated with the way things went, then you can take that frustration of not having like achieved the maximum, you know, uh, the maximum potential or fulfilling the maximum potential, and then take that on and, and try to do something else, something better, something that that would last. So, uh, so the problem was not have you know selling the capsule and having it, uh, you know, acquired. The problem was that I thought that it was not fulfilling the potential that it was supposed to have, and it was an amazing company. Uh, and I think it could have gone all the way, but you know, unfortunately, I think it didn't go out that way. So, so you know, I, I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> it was like a child. Yeah, and so like it, it, it was sort of, there's a, a sort of grief uh, related to that, and then you sort of have like, we need to fix that, I need to have something uh, to fix that. And that, that was the yeah. basic idea. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this. Yeah. Um, so um, I want to talk a bit about a little bit about leadership. So you work in different companies that grew very fast, from yep. five to two to fifteen to eighty to hundreds of employees. Um, how? What tools um, you have to guide your managers as you grow to keep the, the the commander's spirit and the right messages from up down. Um, as the company grows. So when you have five, 10 people, it's easy to get all the messages and all the vibe of the company come across. But then you have 15, 20, you have managers and more managers. What would be your tip to growing companies here to make sure that the messages and the vibe? Yeah, anyone in the, the audience, DNA. A, anyone in the audience would, would define themselves now or in the past as managers, managing like people? Uh, I used to manage. Yeah, like eight people. cool. So, at first, managing is, is something that's really, really uh, easy for people in the start. Because it's basically just an extension of their own capabilities, right? If you're a team leader, and you know, you know what's going on, and you can manage by leading and by example, and it, it, it's really easy, it's really, really uh, the natural progression. But at some point, if you start to manage more people, and and, and maybe even teams of people, or teams of teams, uh, you're gonna get the call. You know, someone is gonna have the conversation with you. Uh, by the way, is anyone here like, have been like second, second line manager? Not so, right? So, if you go on and grow, then someone will take, you take you and, 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 and put out the, the conversation about, you should really, you know, get back and stop, you know, don't be so hands-on, give people opportunity, don't micromanage, etc. And people often misunderstand what micromanagement means and what not to do and, and, and should do. 
And I think that, that that's something that we're trying at Cato to be really, really disciplined about and to explain. And I think that's one of the things that make it a unique company that you should really, uh, you know, go to all your friends and recommend it as a place to work. Uh, <laughs> By the way, they're hiring. They're hiring. Anyway, Just making sure you remember. But, 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 but what we're telling, but, but what we're telling people is make the distinction as you become managers, but also like when you're employee, uh, when you individual make the distinction be between being in the details of something and really you know tracking mails and progress and what, uh, what what's going on in Slack and what and being in the details of something versus having deep domain knowledge. And I think what happens with companies that grow, grow really, really fast, or people that advance really, really fast, is that they fail, they, they, they keep updated, they're in the details, they know what's going on, but at some point what they neglect is the understanding of the deep you know, technology that they've come from, et cetera. And especially once your scope grows, you know, you're not going to understand everything that you manage. And as a company grows, you're not going to understand everything that you manage really, really clearly as you understood what you actually worked on with your hand. So you see more and more managers as they progress managing from their memory. They're not learning new things. They're managing from what they remember happened. And, and that has nothing to do with being a micromanager or not micromanaging. It does not have anything to do with in-detail knowledge and not having in-detail knowledge of what's going on. It's about whether you really understand what's going on at the ground level of your, you know, organization. You know, whether you manage a team, or whether you manage a group, or whether you manage, you know, something bigger than that. And the thing is that if people stop learning new things, and they stop going into like what's the experience of the developers, what's the experience of the salespeople, etc., they stop learning new things, and they just put themselves with all the details of the day-to-day, -day, they become less and less good managers over time. That's, that's my perspective. So what, what I tell people to do is invest in learning things. If you were a programmer and people say, yeah, you, you should stop, stop doing that, it doesn't make any sense. No, you should go and drill down into the areas that you know less about. Even at the expense of keeping up to date with whatever's going on, but learn the areas that you know nothing about today because these are the areas that that might get corrupted and you won't know that. So it, it looks like something that has to do with technology, but I'll give a, a, a story because I had this, like, like this conversation yesterday and I was talking with our VP of HR and, and I, actually I mentioned it before. So one example was that, uh, you know, a VP of HR in a company I'm, I'm really hoping that I'm not like, <laughs> she's, I, I'm talking about her like this and she's not here, but never mind. We but, can send it to her. Yeah, yeah, she'll, 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 be, she'll but, but generally, uh, and I also talked about it in the past, so it's okay, she knows. Uh, <laughs> um, but one of the things is that, you know, being a VP of HR is a lot of detail, right? You need to really keep up to what's going on with the processes, what's going on here. The work, it's a lot of mail to read and, and, and calendar and, and, your, and your calendar is full. But, but then there's something that she needs to learn and there's something that, that she doesn't know very well. And, and one of the, for example, is like the legal situation in Europe or the, the job, the, all the legal stuff that goes around job, which is really, really complex, needs a lot of, of work, needs a lot of drilling down into. So needed, she needed to clear time for her to understand what's going on and, and to understand this scope that was like a blind spot for her. But once she did that, and once she cleared that information, and once she was deep in the knowledge there, she could have like conversation with lawyers and with people on her team and, and not waste time communicating and having them explain to her all sorts of stuff. Because she was like an insider then. And she took the time to do that at the expense of maybe keeping up to date and what the, what the percentage is, et cetera, et cetera. So at some point, she cleared the time, did, dug down deep into understanding something that was a black hole. And I think all managers to, should do that. They should take the time, maybe a third of their time, really digging in and understanding what's going on in the areas of their organization that they know little about. And, and without it, 
you get like stagnation in the end. So that's 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 what we're trying to do at Cato, yeah. and that's the kind of company Cato is, and that's why it's a great place to work. Pushing, pushing people forward, really. Yeah, no, That was an amazing, amazing tip. And actually, my next question is another question, last question about, I call it the routine of a leader. And again, not every day that I get to, uh, to interview leading a company. And I'm, I'm sure you have routines that we can all learn from. One thing that I read is that uh, you investigate all events and productions uh, and what happens in the market uh, every week. Like you have a week, uh, like an investigation meeting once a week. Mm -hmm. so there's maybe another tip that you can give us that is, you think, possibly unique to, to Cato, that is a routine that really helps you excel and keep competitive? So, maybe I, I can explain like the, the, the weekly investigation that mm -hmm. we do and, and, and what it really means uh, and why I think it's, it's something that's central to the way companies should behave and how companies should be managed. Um, and um, maybe what's, what's the best place way to put it and the thing is that you know if you if you're a company you don't necessarily improve over time I mean you know how you operate but you operate in different areas etc but do you improve over time and the only way that you can improve over time is set up specific feedback loops around what you're doing wrong where you can improve and it's very very difficult to set up a feedback loop around things that are as big as a project. I mean, has anyone here uh, participated at some point in a post-mortem of a project, a large-scale project, like three months project? Was it helpful at all? Was it? Yeah. Because three months is a lot to, you know, to parse, right? Mm -hmm. How do you learn something that happened like in three months? What, was it good? So basically, if you have like a, a three-month-old project you know, with a post-mortem, you basically have like different stories people tell about different times and, 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 and they're basically uncommunicating, etc. because you need to have a feedback loop that works. And the thing is that one of the areas where feedback loops actually work is production issues. And if you look at the production issues and ask the right question, you can improve and sort of take, you know, uh, it's, 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 the scope is small enough to actually figure out what went wrong and how to improve. And that is a feedback loop. And I think that the, the idea of feedback loops in a company and in a product is just so, so important because startups that have broken feedback loops have crappy products. That's, you know, from experience. Uh, so, so getting that loop into improvement is, is, is terribly important. That's, that's amazing. Thank you so much. Now I have a few, uh, I would say rather uh, short questions and then we'll go over uh, to you. So the first one would be, um, um, you said, and I think also in our preliminary call, that the journey um, is your teacher. However, if uh, you could still uh, name uh, one tip that, um, that, that you wish you had when you started, what would it be? Except wear a sunscreen. Um, <laughs> There's a song for that you can find in a group. <laughs> actually, actually, I've been asked that a lot. I, I, I'm, yeah. I've now started saying, you know, that if I could give a tip to, to, to uh, young yeah, people, it would be keep a journal. Uh, what you what you think you remember now is not really what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so I really can't really attest to what I did like 10 years ago. Yeah. I really wish I had a journal then to keep, you know, Figuring out what what actually went there and wear sunscreen and, and wear sunscreen. <laughs> with yeah right on the beach so very cool tip and the third the second thing I know that uh, that you love reading books and listening to podcasts and uh, you just mentioned a book before but is there any book or podcast that uh, you think we should would be beneficial for us? Uh, oh, that's I, I didn't think about it, but I, I'll just suggest in general that. Books and podcasts are so important, and if you, if I, I think maybe I'll put podcasts aside because people, you know, listen to podcasts like they're they're, you know, like, like they're crackers or, or some sort of uh, <laughs> Cheetos or something. It's 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 it's, it's easy, it passes the time, it's cool. It's like, but if you don't read books, then you lose a lot of of, of, of the dimension of, of, of thinking about things, etc. I think. 
it's incredibly important to read not just and, and, and not just you know uh, um, not just to listen to things but to read and I think that the fact that today there's audiobooks means that you can get back to the world and try to you know read more and without it you lose a lot of the dimensions of, of things and, and there are amazing books out there about how to run a sky company, how to sell, how to do this, how to do that, as well as things that you just you know enrich the lives of people. So just read audiobooks if possible. That's that's I don't have like. Do you have any to topics that you, you specifically like to read about? I try to read all sorts, uh, from like mystery to science fiction to uh, self help to uh, business to economic to uh, languages. So. Uh, I don't remember yeah. much of it, but, but I try to read. And personal tip, don't forget your book in your vacation. I just I, I bought a book, I read half of it, and I forget it, forget it in the hotel oh, somewhere in Miami. No. So it just really hurts, but I'll go back to my... Maybe someone can tell you the ending. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you later, I'll tell you later. It's a, yeah, espionage uh, kind of book. Okay, that's someone should definitely tell you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And last question is, um, what drives you these days? What's your passion? What drives you in, in work, in life, these days? Um, I, I don't know. I, 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 maybe I'll pass on that question. But, <laughs> okay. but uh, I think every day, uh, just just being concentrated and being maximizing the time in the day where you're in flow. Uh, I don't know if you read or know mm -hmm. about this concept of flow. If you maximize the time in the day that you're in this mode and you're engaged and you're doing stuff, that's that's probably that's a, that's a great time. That's a clear time until you really fulfill yourself. You're in the zone, and that's that's in that's, the zone is like yeah. a good. Word that's a it. good time to yeah. yeah. So that's, that's a great as point many, to be as in. many hours yeah. as possible yeah. in the in the day where you're in the zone, either either alone or together with people doing like creative work together or or discussion brainstorming. Versus the mind-numbing, you know, presentation meeting yeah. where you just go slide by slide by slide onto oblivion. So, thank you so much for getting us into your world.